I was just wondering, I know we don't always look at, um, at insulin resistance um, in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of research fashion, but we'd probably perhaps use the metabolic syndrome. Did you by any chance classify your, your people by metabolic syndrome? And was there a, a, a difference in terms of your, your black and white percentage of metabolic syndrome people? I don't know, yes, it, is this thing on No. Yeah, okay. Um, that's a really good idea. And no, we didn't. That's the short answer. We didn't look at it that way. But we have all the data. We ran lipids. Um, we probably have blood pressure from when they, their clinic visits, and we could potentially do that. So I'm going to put that on my to-do list. Thank you. Uh, so I, I very much enjoyed that. I have two questions, one to Michael and one to Denise. Actually, when you published your paper with Keith Frain in 2005, I believe, in Diabetologia, uh, this was what got us into the research on actually the non-digestible fiber and resistant fiber. So um, perhaps <laughs> we start at the same time in, in this field. Um, but my question to you would be, uh, as you have no response in diabetics and uh, GIP, um, is a hormone which does not work in diabetics and may be related to some of those effects. Did you measure GIP in those studies and would it be possible that you can explain those effects through effects of GIP on whatever intestinal or lipid or muscle related mechanism? Um, quick answer, no, we didn't measure GIP. Um, it, it could be a, a GIP related mechanism. We have measured GIP before in other groups and didn't find anything, which is why we didn't tend to measure it in the diabetic group because it's always a, you know, it's always a balance with the amount of blood and funds and things. I would say the main reason we really think that, that the issue with the diabetes group is just the, the massive amount of background heterogeneity. When we have the, the healthy groups, obviously they're not as homogeneous as an animal group, but you can kind of narrow it down quite a lot by recruitment. But in the diabetic group, you have a, a group of individuals and sometimes the only thing they have in common is a diagnosis of diabetes. They're so variable. And it was, you know, we've, we, we haven't done many studies in diabetes. That was one of the first ones. And we were quite surprised just the, the variability in simple insulin resistance, the variability in their insulin production. And these were all patients who had had diabetes for, for an average four years. So they weren't necessarily doing what the textbooks were telling us they, they should be doing. And I think the heterogeneity is probably the biggest issue because in some patients it worked beautifully and in others it didn't. And I think we need to try and get to the, the back. And it could, it could be the microbiota because that's, that's becoming a huge issue in diabetes. And we didn't measure it because it wasn't trendy when we were doing our grant. But in the future we would to try and narrow down responders and non-responders. Because well, if I may say a word to that, the, uh, actually we repeated your work with the re resistant starch and in that paper where we used uh, non-digestible, uh, non-soluble fiber, we saw the same effects as you described originally. And we also had a group with resistant starch as a control, which worked nicely. But we also used fiber which was non-fermentable and we saw the same effects. Yeah. So we can quite clearly, at least in those, we always get these about 17% improvement of insulin sensitivity best in prandial related mm. insulin sensitivity. Amazingly, it's not the liver. I don't understand that at all. Oh, so, so you find that as well? It's not the liver? Well, so as far as we have gone, yes, we, we see muscle in yeah. clamps. We see it best. And well, I don't know how the weight of the muscle goes. But second question to Michael. I always see this little arrow to AMPK. Is, could you detail the mechanism? I also saw that, I believe, in papers from you before, but I never saw any literature which really explains that. Yeah, that was, that was in the 2013 review in Journal of Lipid Research. Uh, when I looked at it first, I thought, because usually that means lower energy, and then you're responding. Um, so I'm not sure of that, of that mechanism, but it was, it was in that, that 2013 review. Those uh, arrows are always easy to draw, isn't it? 
Yeah, but it, and, and it was surprising because when Denise talked and, uh, and what you mentioned, no, no effect on the liver, it was all muscle uptake. So what I said about maybe affecting gluconeogenesis in the liver, which was from that review article, that may not be true. It's all uptake. Thank you very much. We have Christian in front. A short one, please. I'm Thomas Lin from Gießen, Germany. Uh, just a question to understand uh, regarding the um, inconsistency of the glycemic response and the heterogeneity of the diabetic patients. So what you aim at is really, as far as I understand, fermentation, right? So fermentation, would, would it make sense to quantitate this, for instance, by using hydrogen breath tests and then uh, identify additional factors that can explain these uh, non-consistent results, especially with the acute insulin response and insulin sensitivity that you showed? So would it make sense to, this is a question for all who are doing clinical studies, to make these hydrogenic, uh, hydrogen breath tests, do you think they, they would be positive in a, in a patient that is using resistant staunch? I would say um, we have done hydrogen breath tests, so the, the patients are fermenting. It's not that you haven't got, they're not fermenting anything. I think that the difference is it may just be the, the, the background microbiota may be very different. So a hydrogen breath test wouldn't be sensitive to that. We've measured um, plasma short-chain fatty acids in, in various groups. And interestingly, the only group where we didn't find an increase was in the diabetic group. So, you know, in the healthies and the insulin resistance, you do see an increase in, in plasma short chains, but in the diabetic group, we didn't see. So there is something different about this group that, and, and nobody else has done any, any further work in them. So we, we need to, you know, do, do further work in this to work out, you know, what, what is it that is different, that is not getting this expected response that we would expect based on the animal data, but also on the, the healthy human data as well. Gabriele Riccardi, Frederick II University of Naples. <clears throat> I have a question for Denise. Uh, you, you, one of, of, of the, inconsistency, the inconsistency in the results that you have shown might also be due to the methodology that you have employed <clears throat> to evaluate insulin sensitivity. Because most of the study where you get a beneficial effect on insulin sensitivity, you utilize the insulin clamp. Conversely, you, you get negative or non-significant effect when you utilize the intravenous glucose tolerance test. Uh, have you sought to the possibility that these two methods that we both utilize as uh, interconvertible to measure insulin sensitivity, they in fact are measuring different aspects of insulin sensitivity. Also because in your diabetic patient you still see that the, the, the arteriovenous difference in, in muscles of glucose is improved after the, the resistance starch. So, I mean, the, the, there must be some metabolic effect that you are not able to evaluate with the method that you employ to, to measure the overall insulin sensitivity. Do you think this can be a reasonable or, or, or way of uh, interpreting, among other uh, ways, the, the inconsistency of your results? Okay, um, I would say with, with the, the diabetes group, we did use the clamp. So we, were, we weren't using the IVGTT. And obviously the, the clamp is, is seen as the gold standard. And, but you, you do have the situation with a clamp where you are giving quite high doses of insulin. And the insulin that you get at, at plateau is much higher than what you would get sort of prandially after, after a meal. And you've also got no effects of, of, of the gut. And if there was a, an important gut factor in there that was having an effect, the clamp isn't going to look at that. It's only going to look directly at sort of peripheral metabolism. With the insulin resistant group, when we did it for four weeks, we were actually wanting to look at, at insulin secretion because another paper had, had come out in fiber that had found this effect. So we thought, well, maybe that's, maybe that's an explanation for our data as well, which is why we changed methodology at that point. We hadn't there was no kind of conspiracy. We decided we actually wanted to look at insulin secretion and that would be the best model for this. And obviously the, the IBGT isn't gold standard for insulin sensitivity, but it is very well validated. And we wouldn't expect to go from a 20% improvement to potentially a decrease by cha changing the model like that. So I don't think it's necessarily the model, although I, I think it, it's more just in that group we weren't we hadn't given them it for as long 
and and it was only about 50 percent of them went up whereas 50 percent of them didn't so it could be again everyone everyone might have their unique time, time frame and people are adapting it at different a different rate and you know we need longer thank you very much yeah. Oh no, they're not. They're not. They're not the same. But in the in the in the diabetic group, which is the group we really couldn't translate it into, we did use clamp, and we used identical methodology to what we'd used in our insulin resistant group. Good. We have one last question here. Short one, please. Jenny Brand Miller, University of Sydney. Thank you for your presentations this morning. They were beautiful. It's, this is a comment. Instead of studying type two people. What about the most vulnerable group in the population, which is pregnant women? You have nine months, and, and in that time you see hard clinical outcomes. You see the birth weight, the body composition, you see whether they have gestational diabetes or not, and they're highly motivated to improve their own health as well as their babies. And you get the babies at the end to study and follow up. <laughs> <laughs> we all start as an embryo, so it's relevant to everybody. Can I just answer that quickly? Just Eddie, there is a study. Okay. Uh, they are not here today, but there's a study. Okay. It takes a long time. No. <laughs> but yes, that's coming. Okay. Do we have a smart comment comments here before closing? For a suggestion? It's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you very much for closing this session here. Yeah, there will be a coffee break now. Thank you very much.